Um, thanks, Jen, and thanks for coming today. Thanks for the invitation to have me. Um, I'm, like Jen said, going to talk about some uh, recent work on ecoevolutionary dynamics during range expansion. And I want to start by um, setting some context and thinking about different scales of organization and ecology and evolution from individuals up to ecosystems. My interests and the work in my lab and, and the work in this talk focus on the level of population dynamics and specifically thinking about the ways in which individual level processes translate to driving change in population size and composition. And in making that translation from individual level to population level processes, there are two basic categories of mechanisms that we need to be thinking about. And those are demography and dispersal, which are the two possibilities for all the things that can drive change in population size or composition. So demography meaning all of the processes that give rise to births and deaths, and dispersal being the, the process of individual movement in space. And the interaction of these two forces generates, among other things, patterns of population spread and range expansion. And it is this range expansion process that I'm going to focus on as the really um, central theme of this talk. So we can think about range expansion as simply the increase in density both locally, so these are lines that represent slices through time, so locally densities increase and then there's a spatial expansion part that looks like a traveling wave that um, advances through space. So this concept of range expansion really lies at the heart of some of the most urgent challenges in ecology with respect to global change because it is range expansion that governs the spatial dynamics of biological invasion by exotic species. And we're also now increasingly recognizing range expansion by native species in response to climate change. So ecologists are called upon to understand and predict the dynamics of range expansion. And so that's going to be some of the motivating force behind the work that I'll present today. So um, over the past 10 years or so, we've grown to recognize that genetic variation in these individual level processes of demography and dispersal raises the potential for ecoevolutionary feedbacks, where the ecological dynamics of population spread uh, generate selective pressures that can modify demography and dispersal that can then feed back to the ecological dynamics. So this talk is really going to focus on these eco-evolutionary feedbacks between demography and dispersal and the population level process of range expansion. So I want to unpack what I mean by that. And we can start by thinking about dispersal as a probabilistic process that we can represent as a kernel or a probability distribution. And most dispersal kernels look something like this, where most of the probability density lies at short distances. And there's a long distance tail that represents rare movement um, very long distances. So if we think about dispersal during range expansion, what happens is it's very few individuals that sample this long distance tail and occur at the leading edge of an expanding population. And that necessarily means that those individuals will occur at low density. And we generally expect negative density dependence to give these low density environments a demographic advantage such that individuals at the leading edge of their invasion wave may leave more descendants per capita by uh, being relieved of negative density dependent pressure that individuals in the core of their range might experience. So this so far is, is sort of classic theory for ecological dynamics of spread where we know that it's the long distance movement and the population growth from low density that collectively govern the rate at which spreading populations can move. So classic ecological theory uh, assumes that it's entirely random which individuals sample the tail of their dispersal kernel and thus end up at the expanding edge of their population wave. We could alternatively hypothesize that there may be a genetic basis to which individuals travel very far. So if there's genetic variation in dispersal, then alleles that favor long distance dispersal are non-randomly represented in the tail of an invasion wave and in the tail of the dispersal kernel. So if that's the case, then there is a spatial structure by which good dispersers mate with other good dispersers at the leading edge of an invasion. And they may leave more descendants per capita because they're in low density environments. 
And so this combination of heritable ba basis to dispersal and spatial structure by which good dispersers mate with other good dispersers at the leading edge of an invasion collectively represent a process that's been coined spatial selection that can favor an increase in dispersal ability during range expansion. Basically the accumulation of better and better dispersal alleles as a population expands because of the sorting process that naturally sorts good and bad dispersers or short and, and longer distance dispersers. So the other evolutionary force that operates during range expansion is that these low density environments at the leading edge of a population uh, are essentially under our selection. So meaning that they are low density, so individuals that can leave more descendants and regenerate rapidly will be overrepresented at the expanding edge through time because it's the descendants from the leading edge of last generation that non-randomly colonized the leading edge of, of the next generation. So there's essentially a serial R selection environment at the expanding edge of a low density population wave. So collectively, these evolutionary forces we expect should favor increased dispersal ability and increased fertility at the expanding edge of an invading population. And because we know that it's these specific demography and dispersal processes that drive the ecological dynamics of spread, we can therefore expect that there should be an evolutionary acceleration of range expansion if we have heritable variation in both demography and dispersal. So that is sort of where the theory of eco-evolutionary dynamics of range expansion kind of stands. We actually have a lot of theory for this. I gave you the sort of short version of it. So the predictions are clear that evolution should accelerate the ecological dynamics of spread. Our empirical understanding of these dynamics lags behind theory. And it's not necessarily because we're data limited. We have a lot of really nice data sets, in fact, on uh, empirical patterns of population range expansion. The hard part is identifying the contributions of these evolutionary mechanisms to the ecological dynamics. And that's true even in cases where these evolutionary mechanisms are implicated. So the cane toad invasion of Australia is probably the best example where we know that the leading edge cane toads have longer legs and greater dispersal ability. That is sort of a smoking gun that these evolutionary processes may be important for spread dynamics, but we can't retroactively say how much evolution contributed to patterns of spread um, from data sets like these. So it's that uh, limitation that motivates our work in a laboratory system. And here's the part of the talk where I try to convince you that I'm actually a field biologist, but the entirety of what I'll tell you about today comes from a laboratory system that we work on specifically because it allows us to, uh, it gives us a tractable um, context in which to study spatial expansion processes that are very difficult to, to study in the field. So the system is uh, this bean beetle, which is a pest on beans, um, and that, that them being pests are actually convenient for us because it means that they're very easy to take care of. So these are beetles that lay eggs on beans. Um, eggs develop inside of beans. The adults pop out after a couple of weeks of development, lay eggs for the next generation, and die. So it's a, a short life cycle of about a month. Um, it's a, so, and it's a very um, well-contained system where we don't have to give them any other resources other than beans. They get all their water, water and all their micronutrients from beans. Um, really, really nice uh, uh, weedy kind of beetle. So this is the organism that we work with. And we give them a spatial context to invade to study the dynamics of their population expansion. And we do that in this intentionally contrived and abstracted setup where we have local habitat patches which consist of petri dishes filled with beans and we allow beetles to spread through these dishes. So it's clearly uh, an intentional simplification of range expansion that we know happens in nature, but the core elements of demography, local birth death processes that happen within patches, and then spatial redistribution among patches allows us to distill this very complicated process to its very fundamental ingredients. And to, to bring this system to life a little better, um, we'll see, I have a video that may or may not work. It's not gonna go. Oh, my computer wants to restart. Oh no, there it is. Let's see if this works. Maybe, this is a, a video that my university press team put together that maybe not, maybe it won't load. That's okay, sorry about that. Oh. Why do they spread here or retract through space? So here we have like, a starting patch, for example, and it's full of beetles that haven't really moved very much. And as we 
proceed down the line, we can see that we get fewer and fewer beetles in all of these patches until we get to the very leading edge. There's only a, a couple beetles in this patch actually. So out of this population, these beetles are the best dispersers. And um, if they mate, the idea is if dispersal ability is heritable, they'll pass on these strong dispersal genes to their offspring. So these, these are like two, two gold medal beetles at the leading edge of this invasion. Um, and over multiple generations, you can get evolution for um, better and better dispersal ability, which makes these invasions spread faster. Okay, so that was Brad Ochaki, who's a PhD student in my lab. Uh, and actually, I'll, I'll mention him again because it's a lot of his work that, that I'm actually presenting today. So in case you couldn't tell from that video, this is actually a one-dimensional environment where patches are connected um, in a pairwise way, and they make loops around each other, but it's actually not a 2D grid. Okay, so we're looking at spread through one dimension. And like we expect from classic theory, we see invasion waves through this one dimensional habitat where every line here represents um, the state of a population in its um, local density and its spatial distribution through time. And the real power of a system like this and the reason, main reason we do it is that we can replicate this, things that we can't do in the field. So here's a bunch of replicates of range expansion in beetles. One of the really interesting patterns that emerges from looking at across replicates is that we get a lot of variability um, in this simple environment, the simplest of all possible worlds. So just as an example, if you compare these two replicates, this one moved about twice as far over 10 generations as this one. So this idea of variability, even in a simple homogeneous environment, will be a, a, something that will emerge as a, as a theme. Okay, so here's an outline of the work that I want to tell you about. So I'll first tell you about some work that's asking this question of how the spatial selection process modifies the ecological dynamics of spread using this very tractable laboratory system. I'll then tell you a little bit about some work on genetic constraints that could modify the eco-evolutionary dynamics of spread. And then ask whether genetic admixture across multiple populations can limit responses to selection during range expansion. And I want to acknowledge Brad, who you just met in the video, and Natalie Wagner, who was an undergrad in the lab, who um, also contributed a lot to this research. Okay, so first thinking about how spatial selection can modify the dynamics of spread. What we'd really like to do and can't do in those field systems is we want, we want to contrast what happens during range expansion when you have evolutionary processes operating and not. We want to make a simple contrast of evolution on and off to see how much it matters because most ecologists typically don't consider evolution when they're modeling their, their um, spread dynamics. So we did this with a very simple experiment where we had a treatment that was essentially a control treatment where we allowed spreading populations to sort themselves as they naturally would, meaning that good dispersers end up disproportionately at the leading edge of their invasion wave. So there's a sorting by dispersal phenotype that happens as it always would in any spreading population. So this was essentially a control scenario. And we contrasted that with another set of replicate spreading populations where we shuffled the um, spatial locations of all individuals in each generation. So literally in every generation, we picked up all the beetles, put them in a bowl, shook the bowl, and put them back down in exactly the same density uh, sort of gradient that we found them. So we left all of the ecological stuff, the density dependence was exactly constant across um, these treatments. The only thing that changes is that we uh, shuffled the allelic distribution of, of these invasions such that we, we prevented the accumulation of good dispersing or, and high fertility alleles at the invasion fronts. And we simply wanted to contrast what happens when we do these two different things. What do the invasions look like? And we also wanted to know something about the trade evolution that happens during range expansion in these, in these treatments. And so after 10 generations of spread, we took these beetles out of their leading edge patches, reared them through two generations of a common garden environment, and looked at their demography and dispersal traits. So here's some top level uh, results from this experiment. Th this is the average kind of trajectory of these spreading populations in these two treatments. And this is an, a nice kind of result in that we can see very clearly without needing any fancy statistics that in fact the control uh, scenario, meaning the spatially selected populations, spread much farther on average than those in which we shuffled 
the allelic distribution across these spreading populations all else equal. So there's clearly some kind of influence on the ecological dynamics of spread. We can unpack that result a little bit further, uh, looking here specifically at each uh, replicate across generations with respect to their farthest patch invaded. So uh, again, we see this pattern where the red lines, which are the, the control spatially sorted treatments, spread farther than the shuffled treatments. So that, that emerges from this kind of view of the data as well. But what we can see here that is a sort of new and surprising result is that there's also a lot more variability in the populations that were spatially sorted and spatially selected, such that we actually get the slowest invasions and the fastest invasions when these evolutionary mechanisms are operating, um, even though on average there was an increase in the speed and extent of these invasions. So spatially selected invasions were faster on average, but also a lot more variable. And the variation was across replicates, meaning that each of these lines represents a unique evolutionary trajectory that was more different when they were undergoing uh, the spatial selection than when we suppressed that mechanism. So I'll come back to, to why we think that happened. So I want to now look at the traits that evolved during range expansion. And we have this expectation that both fertility, meaning the reproductive rate under low density conditions, and dispersal should be evolving during range expansion. We found no evidence that fertility evolved during range expansion. So these are results from uh, rearing beetles through a few generations of a common garden environment after range expansion. And there's no difference between our treatments in their reproductive output. So fertility did not evolve during this experiment. So that can't explain why we see these faster invasions with evolutionary mechanisms operating. Dispersal did evolve. And we think it was dispersal that can explain why we saw the ecological patterns that we did. So I'm showing dispersal data in two ways with uh, raw data are represented in histograms, which are these bars. And then the same data are also represented as these cumulative distribution functions. And the main thing that I want you to take away from this is that the spatially selected populations have a longer tail to their dispersal kernels, which corresponds to a slower rise in the cumulative uh, distribution function. Okay. So this, again, came out of a common garden environment a few generations after the experiment ended. So the descendants of these spatially selected invasions did have longer dis tailed dispersal kernels. They traveled farther. They also had greater variability in their dispersal kernels. And this is a result that you, you do need statistics to, uh, to get. And, but maybe you can see that these red lines, which correspond to the spatial selection treatment, are more variable in the shape of the dispersal kernel, um, where we do get longer tails on average in the red lines than the blue lines. But there's also more heterogeneity across the replicates when we had spatial selection operating. Okay, So dispersal was also greater on average and also more variable, which we think explains the population level results. So then the question is, well, why is there all this variability? And what could be generating all of this extra noise when evolutionary mechanisms are operating? So our best uh, interpretation of this invokes the mechanism of gene surfing, which is a term that's been coined in the population genetics literature for, for some time now. The idea is that in a spreading population, uh, alleles that are initially present at the very leading edge of an expanding population have priority and can go to fixation as the population spreads through totally neutral processes. So it's essentially a spatial analog to genetic drift. And it's a consequence that invasions are characterized by serial founder events, where every generation, it's rare individuals that were at the leading edge of their the last generation's wave that colonizes the new generation's wave. So through time, that can lead to the fixation of alleles through completely stochastic processes. So that would tend to be a variance generating mechanism because every realization of range expansion would be a little different, where there would be a, a little different set of alleles that would come to dominate every expanding population. So you might be thinking, well, isn't the entire point that it is non-random which alleles are present at the leading edge of an expansion? Shouldn't it always be the good dispersing alleles that are there? And so, yes, I think that's true, but that process is not perfect. There's noise in that process, and there's also recombination, which is going to be moving alleles around. So 
in total, we think that we're seeing essentially a tension between the directional and variance reducing forces of spatial selection, which would always be favoring better dispersal and reducing variance. Um, that's, that's balanced against the stochastic and variance generating force of gene surfing, just like there's always a tension between genetic drift and selection in any small population. Um, we think that's essentially what's going on here, such that the outcome is, on average, greater speeds and greater dispersal ability, but um, with amplified noise because of this uh, extra variance generating force, which would have also been suppressed when we applied our shuffle treatment. So this result um, is sort of exciting in the context of what has become uh, a sort of cottage industry of the replication of the replication of range expansion, because uh, it turns out that several groups independently sort of had the same idea to do more or less the same experiment, all within the past couple of years. So, uh, and we're getting some consistent results across groups and some interesting differences across groups. So this is essentially the result that I just told you. The evolutionary mechanisms of spatial selection tend to increase invasion speed on average and also amplify variance on, av on average, which means that we might have less predictability in patterns of spread when these evolutionary mechanisms are operating as they presumably always are in natural populations. I could have given essentially the same talk with a different beetle, which was this group led by Topher Weiss Lehman et al. Um, they worked with flower beetles, did essentially the same exact experiment and got essentially the same exact results. We only learned of each other um, after the experiments were done, um, which was an interesting uh, experience, but it all worked out well. And, and it, these papers are actually published side by side specifically because they're so dramatically similar. Um, there's also similar studies using spider mites, which is this group based in the Netherlands, and then uh, our own Jen Williams had a nice study uh, with Arabidopsis, all of which found this consistent evolutionary acceleration during range expansion. But there were contrasting effects on variance. In the, in the spider mite study, there was actually no effect of evolution on variance, only an increase in the mean. Jen found a reduction in variability while finding an increase in the mean. So the big puzzle is, why are we seeing these differences in the sort of qualitative effects of evolution? Well, first of all, there, there's certainly some consistency, and that's actually a really uh, sort of nice um, validation. But we're also seeing these interesting contrasting differences across studies. So one of the things that Jen and I are working on, which is our, our Canada collaboration, is um, trying to figure out why we're getting differences in the evolutionary effects on variance and predictability of range expansion. And uh, we should have an answer like lunchtime tomorrow, maybe. So um, check back in with us, and we'll see what we've come up with. OK, so I want to uh, move forward in thinking about genetic constraints on demography and dispersal traits, and the ways in which genetic constraints might have influenced um, the specific outcomes in our experiment, but also more generally how these constraints might modify the dynamics of range expansion. So this is motivated in particular by the results that I showed you a few moments ago, where we found evolved increases in dispersal ability during range expansion, but we actually found no, no evolved changes in fertility, which was in contrast to what we had predicted and what is generally predicted by theory. So we'd like to know what, what's going on there and what are the mechanisms that might be constraining evolutionary responses. And there's, there's some obvious evolutionary constraints um, in thinking about both the genetic variation and the co-variation in the traits underlying range expansion, um, demography, and dispersal. So I want to think about defining a trait space uh, given by dispersal and reproductive rate. And we can first of all recognize that different combinations of these traits should translate to different ecological patterns of spread, such that the fastest range expansion should occur at high dispersal ability and high reproductive rate. So, the constraints that I, I'm talking about are basically about, well, first of all, is there sufficient genetic variation in these traits to get an evolutionary response, a phenotypic response to selection? So one hypothesis for our spe specific result is that perhaps we just had more genetic variation in dispersal ability than we had in reproductive rate, um, which would look something like this. So genetic variation is one obvious limiting factor um, and constraint on evolution. 
but covariation can also matter, and specifically the genetic correlations, things that arise from epistasis and pleiotropy and linkage. Um, we know that genetic correlations can modify evolutionary outcomes relative to what we might expect if traits are evolving independently. So to what extent could that matter here? Well, we could have negative genetic correlations between re demography and dispersal traits, which might mean that uh, these that selection would essentially be operating along this axis of variability, which would make this these fastest invasion phenotypes uh, relatively inaccessible to selection. That might also modify the extent to which one evolves at the expense of the other. Alternatively, there can be positive genetic correlations, which would tend to maximize evolutionary acceleration because selection would be operating along this axis of variability and tend to be pushing populations toward these high fertility, high dispersal distance kind of phenotypes. So we wanted to know what the, these genetic constraints looked like, both in our system and then more generally understanding how genetic correlations specifically could modify ecological and evolutionary dynamics of spread. So we did this in the beetle system using an experimental approach that's basically a half sib breeding design. And I'm not going to go into the details of it, but basically by, by putting together different uh, sires and dams, we can attribute how much variation across half sib families is, is due to their sire, which is proportional to their additive genetic variance. So I could, I'd be happy to talk more about those, those methods. I'm not going to go into any of that right now. I'll actually just jump straight into the results for what we found. So I'm showing you uh, genetic variation in the, in the form of the narrow sense heritability, so the proportion of the phenotypic variance that's attributable to additive genetic variance. For both of these traits, and these are posterior densities of these heritabilities, and the key result here is that, in fact, dispersal did have greater evolutionary potential, it had greater additive genetic variation in our beetle system than did the low density reproductive rate. So that certainly was one type of genetic constraint in our, on our experiment, and one reason why we might not have gotten a strong evolved response in fertility relative to the response of dispersal. We also found a genetic correlation and a negative genetic correlation. That is, you know, not our, the posterior density doesn't completely exclude zero, but in totality, this suggests a moderate negative genetic correlation between dispersal and fertility. Okay. So we're dealing with a, some, something like this situation where there is, there is in fact more genetic variation in the dispersal trait axis than there is in reproductive rate, but there's also a negative genetic correlation between those. So we'd like to know to what extent did this pattern of genetic constraint modify the evolved responses that we saw in our experiment. So I'm showing here um, the results of simulation studies that incorporate both the ecological and the evolutionary dynamics of spread. And again, I'm not going to get into the details of that, but I'd be happy to talk more about it. Um, I'm showing you the expected uh, fold change in the evolved phenotypes after range expansion, um, results that come out of our simulation work for both traits with respect to a range of genetic correlation values from very strong and negative to very strong and positive. And the vertical line here represents the point estimate from our empirical system, which is a, a negative correlation between these traits. So the first thing to notice is that dispersal has, like we expect, a greater evolutionary potential. There's an expected greater phenotypic change during range expansion in the dispersal trait than there is in reproduction. And that's reflective of the greater genetic variance in that trait. But the other thing that we see is that the genetic correlation does matter, and it matters particularly for the reproductive rate. So at our, at our observed genetic correlation, we expect about no change in reproductive rate, and we expect about a 30 to 40% increase in dispersal. And that lines up very nicely with the results that we actually got. Had we had no correlation, or, or especially a positive correlation, we would have expected a greater evolved change in the reproductive rate. So the genetic constraints do play a role in the phenotypic change that we documented. And then we wanted to know more about, well, what are, the, what, what are the ecological dynamics at the population level that would result from that? So these are results showing the expected invasion outcomes in terms of extent and the variability of the invasion extent or the invasion speed, again with respect to variation in the, in the genetic correlation. 
So these blue lines are essentially controls that we built into the simulations that turn off any potential for evolution. So they are controls in a sense that evolution cannot operate and so therefore genetic correlations don't matter. So that just tells us that the simulations are working as we, as we want them to. So what we can see is that there are, there is greater invasion speed and greater invasion variability under positive genetic correlations relative to negative genetic correlations. We can also see that even very strong negative correlations, which would be a very strong evolutionary constraint, do not suppress the overall effect of evolution on the dynamics of spread. We still get faster invasions and we still get more variable invasions, even with a very strong negative genetic correlation between those traits. That's true for the beetle system. I'm showing you these results that are based on beetle parameters, but it's also true more generally. So in thinking about why we get these outcomes at the population level, um, some of this is intuitive. So we do get greater speeds at positive correlations, probably because we're accessing these fast invasion phenotypes under a positive correlation scenario. So selection is pushing populations in this direction, which will accelerate things. Then the question is, well, why are they more variable under positive genetic correlations. And if we go back to this idea of stochastic allele fixation and this gene surfing idea, if you imagine a, a random sample of phenotypes from this axis of variability, this will be more variable in the ecological dynamics that result than this axis of variability. So these phenotypes, while they be, be, may be different to have high fertility and low dispersal or vice versa, they would trade off in terms of how they would affect the speed of expansion and thus the variability of expansion. There's more variability embedded in this axis of phenotypic variance. So we think that's why we get these results. So what that tells us collectively is that the genetic constraints that we quantified in terms of reduced genetic variance and the genetic correlations, they suppressed to some extent the evolutionary effects on spread. So we did see ev evolutionary acceleration and we did see an increased variance. But what we conclude from this is that those effects were not as strong as they could have been had we had, for example, no co genetic correlations or especially positive genetic correlations. Okay, so the last thing I want to tell you about kind of follows up on the idea of genetic constraint and specifically the idea of genetic variation as an important constraint. So if variation, additive genetic variation is a constraint on responses to selection during range expansion, that raises an interesting question, which is, does the admixture of multiple populations that often occurs in biological invasions, does that amplify the evolutionary potential during range expansion? So does mixing multiple source populations prime invasive populations for evolutionary acceleration? And this was led by, by Natalie. So to give this a little bit more context, we know um, from several decades now of some really nice uh, invasion biology and molecular ecology that many invasive species are the product of multiple independent introductions of source populations from different parts of their native range or different invasive ranges globally. So these are a smattering of examples of invasive species, all of which are documented to have the, the fingerprints of multiple introductions at some point in their invasion history. And so it's been a long-standing question of whether multiple introductions are actually a catalyst for invasion. Are they highly invasive because they had multiple introductions and maybe increased evolutionary potential? So we're going to sort of address that question again in this, you know, contrived but tractable laboratory system and think about how multiple source populations might change the, the potential spread dynamics. So how might that happen? What are the mechanisms that multiple introductions might promote invasiveness? One of them, as I've, as I've said, is the idea of evolutionary potential from increased genetic variation. So if we take multiple independent populations of some exotic species from different parts of their native range, and we bring them together into a recipient range, which is typically or often what happens if you have, say, shipping destinations that are bringing in things from different parts of their range, you suddenly have a mixture that we would expect all else equal to have additive genetic, increased additive genetic variance and increased allelic diversity relative to any of these original source populations. So that should set the stage for greater responses to evolutionary mechanisms during range expansion.
And that's one way that multiple introductions might promote invasions. An, an, an alternative, but not exclusive mechanism, is that there might actually be some shorter term benefits of genetic mixing in the form of increased heterozygosity and the increased fitness benefits that would be associated with increased heterozygosity. So if you bring together multiple populations into some recipient population and they're mating and they're mixing genes, then at least early on in the invasion process, then everyone would be heterozygous if everyone would, was well mixed. And we know that there can be fitness advantages associated with heterozygosity. That in itself might be and an advantage of mixing multiple source populations. And those are not exclusive alternatives, so both could be happening where you, know, you get some initial benefit of heterozygosity and then selection acts on it. But if we sort of for assume all else equal and think about these two different predictions, then we would expect different ecological dynamics to result from these two pathways by which mixture might promote invasions. So if it's about the increased evolutionary potential that comes from mixing multiple source populations, then we would expect, if we were to track the, the spatial extent of an invasion through time, we would expect that mixture populations, or with those with multiple sources, would eventually start accelerating beyond the trajectories of single source invasions if selection and the um, selection for increased dispersal or reproductive rate would be driving the benefits of admixture. In which case, we might expect that the invasion speeds, which would be basically the, the slope of these relationships with respect to time, that speeds should diverge between multi-source and single-source invasions increasingly through time under a strictly evolutionary uh, benefit of, of increased genetic variation. Alternatively, if it's all about the benefits of heterozygosity and heterosis upon initial reproductive contact, we might expect a greater difference between multiple source or single source populations very early in the invasion process, right upon contact of multiple sources. And all else equal, if you know those back cross and everything kind of goes back to some equilibrium, we might converge back on similar invasion speeds, even though the multi-source the multi -source invasion might have gained some head start that they keep some memory of. So differences in speed would arise early and then dissipate. So these are the um, two sort of qualitative uh, outcomes that we wanted to evaluate um, to, to test whether, which of these mechanisms might more, might, might more strongly contribute to the effects of genetic mixture. And we did that again in this bean beetle system, taking advantage of multiple laboratory lines that we had available that come from all over this beetle's global distribution. And as I mentioned, it is a uh, stored grain pest, so it is found, for better or worse, all over the world. So this is uh, a tree of neutral genetic structure from uh, about uh, 10 uh, independent populations of Calisobrucus maculatus. There are some other, um, other beetle species that are shown as outgroups on this tree. And, and what I didn't mention earlier is that the invasion experiments that I told you about uh, were actually conducted with a, a global mixture of all these source populations. And we did that intentionally because we wanted to maximize the genetic variation that we were selecting on in those invasion experiments. But here we want to specifically isolate what's the role of mixing and how much mixing. So we did that with a diversity uh, manipulation experimental design where we had treatments of monocultures, which were basically just each one of these source populations invading uh, independently. And then we created mixtures with multiple levels of source diversity. So two, four, or six sources that were selected randomly from this pool. And so the goal here was to contrast not just monoculture and, and mixture invasions, but to also test for some dosage effect. Does it matter how many sources go into the mixture? If there is a, a increased additive genetic variance when you put populations together, we might expect some dosage effect that bringing more populations into the mixture should have proportionally um, greater genetic variance and a greater evolutionary potential. So this was basically the experimental design that consisted of about 30 replicate um, invasions. And here were the main results. So we're looking at the extent of the invasions with respect to generation. And I've plotted uh, individual replicates based on their source diversity, one, two, four, or six. And the main result here to notice is that mixture populations, 
those in the red, redder and yellower colors traveled farther and faster than the single source populations. And the lines are actually statistical models that support a monoculture mixture contrast. So there was not a, a dosage effect. It's all about did you mix things or did you not mix things? And if you mixed things, mixed invasions spread farther and faster over six generations. So that was, uh, that was one key result. And then we can ask when that difference first emerged. And so I'm showing you the estimates of invasion speed in these two groups at different at both the beginning and the end of the invasion process. So what we see here is that the difference in speed of mixture and monoculture invasions arose at the very start of the, of the experiment. So actually when we first put all these populations together, where the mixture invasions had about twice the speed in that first generation of spread. Um, so they moved 21 patches on average versus the 12 patches on average of monocultures. And by the end of the experiment, even though the mixtures were farther ahead, they were actually moving at approximately the same speed. So 22 patches per generation versus 20. So the differences in speed arose early and then dissipated. And that was consistent with the expectations that we would have had under, under the hypothesis that it's benefits of, um, of outcrossing and of heterosis that might promote some early advantage of genetic mixing. So that's what the population dynamics look like. We also want to know something about the traits that are responding to genetic mixture. And remember, we have two main classes of traits. We've got demography and dispersal to worry about. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to tell you that dispersal did not respond to genetic admixture. And in fact, the main story is in the demographic responses to mixing. And here's what that looked like. So I'm showing the per capita population growth rates with respect to the wave location of their invasions. So the idea here is that negative values are in the core of the wave and they're under high, strong negative density dependence. Positive values are at the front of their waves and they're at low population density. So in general, we expect positive trends here because that reflects the release from negative density dependence. The main result to notice is that we get uh, a contrast again between monoculture invasions and multiple source invasions that is strongest in the first generation of spread. So there is an overall advantage to mixture invasions in their reproductive rates at the beginning of the experiment. And that, that advantage mostly disappeared by the end of the experiment, which is again lining up with the acceleration that we find at the very start, but then appears to dissipate. So we think that we've got a scenario like this, where there's some effect of genetic admixture that is transient, meaning that uh, there's a benefit that through time goes away. But because range expansion leaves a spatial memory, if you get an early head start, you stay ahead, all else equal, that leaves this lasting signature on patterns of spread. And there's a nice metaphor that comes from a paper by John Drake uh, on a related topic, which is the, the catapult effect of heterosis in biological invasions, where early benefits of mixture, even if it's just some transient benefit of having lots of F1 uh, hybrids or, or outcrossed individuals at the very beginning, that can, can have some lasting effect on, in this case, colonization, colonization success, and in our case, the, the spatial patterns of population expansion, um, again, because there is this memory of the initial stages of invasion, um, even many generations later. OK, so I want to um, sort of wrap up by thinking about this, collectively the sets of results that I've told you about. So evolution, and specifically the rapid evolution of dispersal ability, makes biological invasions and the range expansion process faster and more variable. Um, and that effect is modified by genetic constraints and specifically genetic variation and covariation between the demography and dispersal traits that are driving spread. There's also transient benefits of genetic mixing that can promote faster invasions. And uh, in, case it's, in case you're wondering, um, it might seem like there's some conflict between the last set of results that I showed you, which says that there's really no role of evolution, and the first part of the talk, um, it's not necessarily that evolution doesn't matter in those admixed populations, but we were specifically asking whether admixture 
increases evolutionary potential. So we didn't really have a contrast with a no evolution case. And in fact, we know that those invasions were also evolving. They just weren't evolving more when we mixed in more populations. So collectively, um, this set of results is kind of a good news, bad news uh, story. So the bad news is that all of these things represent challenges for ecological forecasting. So I started this talk by saying that ecologists are increasingly called upon to understand and make predictions about how populations are going to be spreading in this global change context of invasive species and climate change migration. And I've spent the last 40 minutes telling you about ways in which that is harder. Um, so all of these things tend to make the prediction process more difficult. Evolution makes things more variable, less predictable. The, the vagaries of genetic architecture can modify whether that's more or less predictable. Some transient history of you know, contingencies of mixing or not mixing can give things a head start or not. All of this makes forecasting a lot harder. So that's sort of the bad news. I think the good news is that results like this that we're getting from these studies and from other studies like, like Jen's work are helping us to interpret all the variation that we know is already there. So we know that biological invasions are highly idiosyncratic. We already know that they're hard to predict. We've known that for a long time. So at least we can now have a better sense of why they're so hard to predict and what are the factors that make them as variable as they seem to be. And that at least helps us define the boundaries of what the possible outcomes might be for any given case, even if we probably will never nail a point estimate for how fast things will spread across a real landscape. So I'll stop there, and thank you for your attention, and I'll take any questions if you have them. Yeah. Great question. So um, the way that we ended up using the populations that we did was based on what Gorn Arnquist sent us. Um, so these are beetles that, that he had maintained in his lab, and he very generously shared his beetles with us. And so that's what Gorn had, and that's therefore what we used. Um, so that's not a very satisfying response, but that, that is why we used the populations that we did. Although um, I did show um, intentionally that there, we know that there is some neutral genetic structure there, and we also know that there were some phenotypic differences that I didn't go into. But as to your question about how much of it is driven by, you know, maybe one really good invading population, I, I'm going I'm to have another very unsatisfying answer to that. And the answer, of course, is I don't know. And it, it's because um, our design doesn't really allow us to test that because we do not replicate these monocultures. In a classic biodiversity experiment, ideally what you'd like to do is replicate each of your monocultures so that you can rigorously say, here's the expectation for species or population A, all else equal, and here's the expectation for when you mix A and B. We can't do that in part because these, well, I won't, go, I won't give you excuses. We didn't do that. And um, that's ultimately what we would need to do to really identify the contributions of any individual population to their mixture results. Yes. Yeah, we did. And so um, we wondered if there might, if we might get different results from mixing very unrelated populations to mixing very closely related populations. And there was actually no influence of genetic distance on the effects of mixture. Yes. So um, thanks for the question. Um, the, the first point I'll make is that the distribution of uncertainty here is exactly that. It's uncertainty. It's not necessarily genetic variation in this trait. It's just our ability to estimate it. Um, but 
there very likely could be genetic variation in the correlation itself. Um, and I've wondered a lot about that myself, of whether the genetic correlations could actually themselves evolve during spread and what that would do. We haven't tackled that because that kind of explodes in complexity, as you might imagine, at least in a simulation setting. But while I'm here, I was hoping to talk to some of the real quantitative geneticists about exactly that problem to sort of intuit through the consequences of evolvability in genetic correlations itself. So I've completely punted um, the response to that question, but I don't know, and I think it's really interesting. Thanks for the question. So I think the comment is basically if you look at this picture and the lines in it, it looks very different from this picture, which is what the sort of conceptual summary of it. And that's it's a great observation. So basically, there's another part of the story that I haven't told you about, which is with regard to Ali effects. So um, the, the result is that um, the reason why it looks the way that it does in the real data is that these mixture populations not only had the greater reproductive rates that I showed you, they were also more robust to Ali effects, meaning that they were less likely to go extinct at low density than monoculture invasions. And that explains, I think, why they were basically, the mixture invasions were able to hit their long-term spreading speed from the, from the get-go, whereas the monoculture invasions had to get over the hurdle of Ali effects early in spread. And, and there's the theory that shows that Ali effects do this. It causes this lag from when you get started to when you hit your long-term spreading speed. So the reason why those pictures look different in, in short is because Ali effects were stronger in monoculture invasions than they were in mixed invasions. It's a different mechanism of effect that I didn't tell you about, but good catch. Yeah, so, so there's a variability part of this project as well that I also didn't, you guys are astute, you're picking up all the, all the things I didn't tell you. Um, so, the, so the monocultures are more variable, and the reason why we think that is, and we've we dove, really dug into this because the reviewers pushed us hard about this, which is, which is good. Um, I don't think it's an evolutionary variance effect like I showed you at the beginning. I actually think it relates directly to the, the answer I just gave, which is about Ali effects. Because the, the um, well, it's the combination of um, being robust against extinction at low density and having greater reproductive rates, which are the two benefits of admixed populations. Together, that means they had greater population sizes, which means that the sampling of their dispersal distributions was less noisy. So we've done some simulation work to show that because mixed populations were able to sustain larger population sizes, especially early on in the invasion process, that made their, the entire invasion process less variable because small populations would tend to have noisier sampling of dispersal kernels. And that result can actually explain. It does look like the variance is increasing um, later in the experiment, but um, it turns out that if you look at the coefficient of variation, um, it's early in the experiment that the variance in the monocultures um, really starts to explode. And we think that that's because of the smaller population sizes that they had relative to the mixed populations. So does that explain, does that answer your question? Um, that's a really good question, and um, 
I don't know the answer to that, but now I want to go look. Um, so it's given the negative correlation, it's it's actually plausible that um, they were slow because of lower fertility. Um, yeah, thanks for that. That's a good thought. Right. Um, that's a great thought. And I mean, the short answer is no, we actually can't tell those apart, um, other than to say that there's some relative benefit of mixture. Um, we have done other work looking at inbreeding depression in those populations. We don't find strong evidence for it, um, which is why I sort of tended to suggest a, a specifically a heterosis benefit. Um, yeah, so actually, now that I think about it, we actually have the data on inbreeding, and there's not strong inbreeding depression, which itself was surprising. But it could be that they have purged their load long ago, given that these are laboratory lines. Well, I mean, the simplest answer to the question, and in the simplest environment, which is basically our environment, is that they're interacting with, with no one and nothing else other than their resource and others, uh, other similar phenotypes. Um, in a realistic setting, there, you could imagine that long distance movement in a novel context is you're going to encounter novel environments. So there's a whole environmental side of all of these questions that I haven't even touched because I've presented everything as if the environment were completely homogenous and matches an ancestral condition. If you were to put all of these questions into a novel environmental context, which is what happens in most real biological invasions, then you could, you could get very different results. So I don't know if that answers your question, but um, in the simplest setting, which is my setting, uh, there's really only, you're only encountering other like phenotypes um, if you're one of these long distance dispersers. Thank you.